Well, good evening and welcome everybody. Welcome to the West Sussex Record Office for a very special edition of West Sussex Unwrapped Live coming to you on Sussex Day. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Wendy Walker uh, and I'm the County Archivist for West Sussex. Uh, just a few points of housekeeping before we start. We are going to be recording tonight's um, event. Uh, the people being recorded will be the uh, speakers and not the audience, but we want to be able to, uh, to load the event, uh, the recording onto our new YouTube channel, uh, which will be uh, launching towards the end of the week so that you can come back um, and look again and watch it again and hopefully recommend it to family and friends as well. Uh, the other thing to say is that if you have any questions as we go through tonight, and I very much hope that you will have, if you could type them into the chat box at the bottom of your screen, um, I'll monitor those as we go through the evening. And um, I will be putting those questions to our speakers at the, at the end. It's very good to have so many with, of you with us tonight. Um, I'm delighted uh, to, to be able to be with you. And we've got a very special event lined up for you this evening. When the record office closed its doors in March last year, we wanted to try and find a way to be able to share the archives with you, despite the fact that our doors were closed. And we got together with our colleagues in Screen Archive Southeast and started to explore our two collections. And out of that, West Sussex Unwrapped was born. We uh, launched it last year and we had 10 episodes over the summer last year. We had a Christmas special edition in December. And in February this year, we launched series two. So each topic bought um, uh, a blog with archives, films, footage, all around a particular topic that we explored and took you through the archives. Uh, this month's topic is the South Downs National Park, um, a topic for which we had many rich and varied um, collections to share with you. And I think this was one of the reasons that we wanted to not just have our usual episode, but be able to share some more of the material with you tonight. The blog went live at 10 this morning um, and you'll be able to catch up with that and previous episodes um, on our blog and our website at a later date. The two speakers we have tonight um, are Jennifer Mason, who's the Assistant County Archivist and Collections Manager from West Sussex Record Office, and she will be taking you through some of the archives that we hold, and Dr Frank Gray, the Director of Screen Archive Southeast. So I'm now going to pass over to Jenny and ask her to uh, begin the evening for us. Jenny. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so hello and welcome to this very exciting first edition of West Sussex Unwrapped Live. Um, as Wendy has said, um, I'll be talking to you about some of the amazing archives we hold about the South Downs. And more importantly, I'll be showing you some of them. So firstly, I'll just say a little bit about the record office who we are and what we do. So we're responsible for collecting, preserving, and making accessible unique records relating to the history of West Sussex. The record office has been in existence since 1946, and we have been collecting ever since then. We now have over eight miles of documents, which is enough to stretch from Chichester to Selsey. And they're all stored in five environmentally controlled secure strong rooms, like the one you can see on this slide here. Our oldest document is an Anglo-Saxon charter known as the Oslac Charter, and this dates from 780 AD, which means that we hold over 1,200 years of West Sussex history. And whilst we are the West Sussex Record Office, our collections stretch far beyond the county's boundaries. We hold documents relating to sugar refineries in Tanzania, letters that emigrants sent home from America, and the records of um, the capture of Spanish slave ships off the coast of West Africa. And all of these archives are open to all. We're operating with some COVID restrictions in place at the moment, um, but please do take a look at our website to find out a bit more about our collections and about how to use the wonderful material we hold. 
So I'm going to start this presentation with sheep. They're so closely associated with this particular area that there's even a breed known as the South Down sheep. And you can see some fine examples in this photograph here. And they're the ones who have been largely responsible for creating the unique landscape and ecosystem of the South Downs. Soils at the top of the downs were too thin for farmers to use for arable farming. And so they would graze their sheep up there, resulting in the chalk grassland so characteristic of the downs. Sheep would eat larger plants, allowing rare wildflowers to grow up and flourish and to create a really unique biodiverse habitat. And this extensive list of plant lane names um, from the book Heart of a Vagabond by actress turned author Nancy Price, who is also a longtime South Downs resident, gives you a flavour of can just how many different types of plant um, would flourish in that downland landscape. Um, and I love the names, um, they're just so evocative. Um, you have things like eggs and bacon, weasel snout, none so pretty, mind your own business. I think they're wonderful. And it goes to show the importance of the South Downs to the habitat, enabling these rare wildflowers to flourish, and of course the insects that rely on them. Um, returning to sheep, once you start looking out for them, you realise that they appear in so many early prints, drawings and maps as almost incidental features of the landscape, but also important enough to have been included. In this beautifully illustrated 1690 map from the Cowdray archive, which shows land in the parish of Cocking, you can see two small flocks of sheep grazing on the South Downs towards the top of the map. Um, I've zoomed in on them just so you can see the, these drawings in more detail, um, but I, I think they're wonderful. Um, interestingly, the small figures between the two flocks of sheep um, are actually rabbits, um, which of course have also played a role in creating and maintaining that, that unique South Downs landscape. And we see sheep again in this wonderful um, Repton Red book. This volume was created in 1793 by famous landscape designer, Humphrey Repton. It was done for Thomas Peacom Phipps, who is the owner of Little Green in Compton at the time. And in this particular volume, Repton explicitly recognizes the great beauty of the South Downs and recommends minimal intervention in terms of changes to the grounds and estate. In fact, many of his suggestions, such as this one, actually involve removing trees and planting to better showcase the dramatic scenery and stunning views, which you can see in the background of this drawing here. And in relation to this particular drawing, he writes, this view to the southeast is capable of greater improvement than a common observer would suppose possible. Yet this improvement consists merely in removing certain objects before the lovely scene that impatiently waits to be displayed, requiring little aid from art to render them far more interesting than my pencil can describe. We're very privileged to hold a copy of this wonderful volume and to be able to show it to you tonight. As you'll see, the volume is fragile due to the flaps that Repton used to show his before and after views. So we usually ask researchers to use a high resolution digital copy in the search room. The South Downs has also played host to a wide range of leisure and recreational activities. Long before the South Downs Way was declared a national trail in 1963 and opened in 1972, hikers were striding out over the steep hills to explore the countryside around them. One rather tongue-in-cheek guidebook describes a stereotypical South Downs hiker as a huge man striding past with half a house and equipment strapped to his back, obviously intending to brave the elements at night on top of the downs in a tent. That might not be the case for the hikers we can see in this photograph here, um, but it certainly conjures up a very vivid image. Picnicking and camping were two other activities enjoyed on the downs. The scouts had, and in fact still have, um, a large campsite at Hillside at the foot of the downs. Um, and this is probably where these two photographs you can see here were taken. Somewhat more unusually, Jose Weiss, landscape painter and glider enthusiast, used his home near Amberley in the South Downs 
as the base for testing his gliders, using a specially constructed launching ramp that he built on Berry Hill. On the 27th of June, 1909, his unpowered glider, the Olive, named after one of his daughters, piloted by Gordon England, took off from Amberley Mount in what is regarded as the first ever soaring flight undertaken by a glider. And this meant that it was actually rising in the air rather than just descending slowly over a distance. But how would the intrepid South Downs explorer reach the countryside? The South Downs Bus Company provided a solution. With an extensive network of routes from urban areas such as Worthing, Brighton and Shoreham, throughout the Sussex countryside. The South Downs Bus Company brought the countryside within reach of Sussex residents and from people beyond the county. This map is part of a guide which states, here is the ideal place for the rambler. And he will find that excellent bus services from any of the coast towns run to convenient jumping off places for his day's outing. Wander where he will, glorious views will await him. To choose among the many beautiful places worthy of a special visit is an invidious task. you can see in the photograph here. Price lived at High Salvington until her death in 1970 and her bench is still there. And it was thanks to Nancy Price and other campaigners like her that the Downs were preserved to be enjoyed by future generations. The creation of the South Downs National Park has ensured that they will continue to be protected. However, the path to designation as a national park was not straightforward. And in fact, in 1956, the National Parks Authority rejected the case for the South Downs to become a national park on the grounds that extensive damage had been caused by increased arable farming and a reduction in grazing. 
Instead, the Sussex Downs were declared to be an area of outstanding natural beauty in 1966. And it wouldn't be until 2009 that they were finally designated as a national park, with the South Downs National Park coming into full operation in April 2011. And things have come full circle with a renewed recognition of the importance of grazing to the maintenance of this unique ecosystem. Grazing now plays a key role in maintaining these rare habitats, helping to encourage biodiversity and ensuring that these landscapes are preserved to be enjoyed by future generations. Thank you very much for listening and I'll now hand over to my co-speaker, Frank. Thank you, Jenny, and good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here on Sussex Day. Um, next slide, please. Um, I have the real pleasure of being the director of Screen Archive Southeast. We're part of the University of Brighton, um, and our conservation centre is based uh, within the West Sussex Record Office. Um, our work has been really to do with true partnership um, with record offices um, across the region, but especially the West Sussex Record Office, um, because it was our founding partner. Um, our work is devoted to collecting um, screen heritage. And for that, uh, we take as both the Magic Lantern, film, videotape, and now digital files. And our collection begins in the 1890s and it continues to this day. Next slide, please. Our activities um, are, are, are quite incredible, given that um, the moving image, um, especially, is a very fragile and delicate thing. Um, I wish it was like paper, but it's not. Um, it can easily, um, film itself as a medium, easily can easily um, decompose, um, colors can fade, um, and there are all kinds of problems uh, with videotape, and now, unfortunately, also with digital media as well. So what's so important about for us um, when we find a film is to preserve it. Next slide. Um, our collection has come from many, many places, uh, both public and private. Um, and it includes both um, family films, uh, films by make, made by local authorities, um, organizations, companies, the armed forces. Um, and together they provide us with a portrait, um, a moving image portrait of the region. Next slide, please. And of course, today, um, not surprisingly, um, what's so important to us is our website, because this is where we provide free access to our collection and it enables um, users, visitors um, to approach it through, to approach the collection through various themes, through, through the search engine. And it, it enables you to kind of tour the collection um, and discover. Um, because that's what's so important about not just our collection, but also the collection of the record office, is that there's things we have that you don't know about. Um, and we're always very excited when you visit us and begin to explore our collections. Now, what I've, what I, we have prepared for you tonight um, is a tour through some of our films, um, which were made on the downs. Um, this is a collection which um, shows many, many different activities um, on the downland for over a century, but also to the way in which the downland um, has inspired filmmakers, how men and women with their cameras have chosen to explore the downs. I'm using that word explore again, but it's, it's true because um, there are just so many things to find and to capture for the future. Now, the first film, uh, which we're going to show a short extract from, is entitled Down to Sussex. Um, it was made in 1964 by British Transport Films. It's colour, sound, um, and was designed to be in, shown in cinemas, community halls and schools. British Transport Films um, specialised, as you'd expect from the title, in films which would encourage us uh, to use buses and trains. Um, this film, of course, begins with the train, not surprisingly. Um, it's this film, Down to Sussex, presents Sussex as a place of tradition and beauty. The opening credit sequence is followed by an introduction to ancient Sussex, where we have aerial shots, sweeping panoramas, the Roman road at Bigner, Chanctonbury ring, a farmer pushing his, pushing his push hoe, and finally, Fox clubs, fox cubs. 
<laughs> Here we are. If you could please start the film. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> stories complete without them. Their straight military roads march boldly over the wide wandering spaces of the Downs. And before the Romans, Sussex history retreats into a mysterious unknown. The long man of Wilmington seems to tell of a looming Wagnerian past. Wotan and northern gods brooding on the elemental Downs. And Chanctonbury Ring speaks to us of Stone Age man. His fire and knack flint all that distinguished him from the savage animals that roamed the wild uplands and the deep forest of the weald. But in the doomsday field, past lies light upon the shoulder. Yes. Good, good, good. Um, this is a film from uh, Elstead, um, which is just north of Chichester and um, five miles west of Midhurst, and was made um, at what was then called the Elstead Manor Farms. Um, it was made over a period of 16 years um, and is a portrait of just not life on the farms, uh, but also to a portrait, provides a portrait of this community. The film begins um, with demonstrations, ancient and modern, um, of the uses of a seed barrow. You've first seen uh, an ancient horse-drawn seed barrow, um, and now, of course, the new technology of a tractor-drawn seed barrow. This whole sequence, I believe, is shot either on or near Beacon Hill. And this, of course, is activity taking place in the early autumn, because this is the planting of autumn wheat. The sequence now sees um, a set of actions to do with um, tillage, uh, the preparation of the soil for, the soil for planting. Um, this is demonstrations of harrowing, of course, using a disc harrow and its set of concave metal discs. And it's followed by leveling with a tractor drawn wooden leveler. Leveler was used to pack down the topsoil and to prevent it from being carried away by strong winds or rain. And after all of those act actions, now of course comes the seed drill. And this of course is a crop which would be harvested um, in the next year in late August, early September.
from the planting of the wheat crop now to the harvesting of a wheat crop, not at Elstead, but this is at um, Woodingdean. And it's the late summer of 1941. The winter wheat is drying, as you can see. The sheaves have been brought together to create the distinctive A-shaped stooks. Terrific panoramic shot, this one. And of course, too, the film is in colour, which was still a very, very rare phenomenon. It had only started five years before. And now, the, of course, the dried sheaves being pitched onto a wagon. What's special for us, of course, is that the film features members of the Women's Land Army. Um, they've been first created in 1917 during the First World War to engage women in agricultural work. And then they were revived at the start of the Second World War in 1939. By 1944, there were 80,000 land girls. Of course, the dried wheat is now going to leave the field and be taken so that it can be threshed and winnowed and then finally uh, to a mill. And now to the sheep fair at Finden. This film of 1978 was made by Mrs. E. C. Edwards, and it's her portrait of the fair. Finden, as many of you know, is just north of Worthing and west of Sisbury Ring. The sheep fair um, began as a charter fair dating from 18, from, sorry, from 1261, uh, and it was later established as a sheep auction in the late 18th century. The fair, both then and now, is staged annually in September. So today the auctions no longer take place, but there is a sheep show and, an, and the village festival. And these friends of ours, these are Dorset Downs um, and they win the prize um, in 1978. And this was a breed developed in the 1800s as a result of crossbreeding Wiltshire, Berkshire and Hampshire ewes with South Down rams. Now to a film made by, made by our friends in Haywards Heath, the Cine Society, and this depicts a wattle maker. Now wattle making really is a Sussex craft. Well, the shepherds and the farmers of Sussex needed the wattles on the hills because hedges were hard to grow. And here you see a, really a relic of a hundred years ago because I know of no other wattle maker in the south. You know, shepherds are solitary men they spent a large part of the life up on the downs with their sheep away from their families, trying to get out of the wind and uh, just watching over the sheep day long and day out. Rather a slow, sedentary pace to life. But one thing they did quickly, and that was to count sheep. But they didn't count them individually, you know, they counted them in pairs as they came to their water dates. And they had a peculiar way of counting. They didn't count one, two, three, as your I would. They used a particular call, where one of them indicated two sheep, shillerum, ten sheep, and then twenty sheep. 
So the call sounded as follows. One of them of copper and sure of shiver and shatter and wine brain bank tail carry diddle din. In other words, two four six eight ten and so on. <laughs> This little village is Amberley, and it's positioned on the River Arran, where it cuts through the downs to the sea. It's a really beautiful spot, and the marshes nearby have been turned into a bird and nature reserve to protect rare, rare species. And now we come to the final film on this evening. Um, and it is a complete film. It's only one minute in length. Um, and it was made by James Williamson in 1899. Um, he was one of Britain's first filmmakers. The film is of Devil's Dyke, um, which of course is renowned for its spectacular 360 degree views. Um, John Constable, the artist declared um, it to be um, the grandest view in the world. Devil's Dyke was a um, popular late Victorian resort um, with a hotel, restaurant, observatory, bandstands, a funicular railway, an aerial cable car, um, a, range of, a range of amusement rides, and its own dedicated rail line, um, which came from the East Coast main line up from Hove. The film um, is, it's remarkable that it survived um, and it's a great pleasure to show it. It has four shots and it begins with swing boats. And now a carousel. We could refer, this, refer to it as a Victorian theme park and to imagine that on a bank holiday in 1899, sometimes there were over 30,000 visitors. And now the cycle track, very unusual thing to us, um, pedal powered and of course, reflects the great enthusiasm for cycling, uh, which was a very distinctive aspect of 1890s life. And now finally, the grand finale. Um, this is the switchback. Switchback, of course, was a precursor to the roller coaster, um, but it's not a circular track. It's a single track and you go up to the top and then you come back down. So that concludes our tour of Devil's Dyke. Thank you, Frank. And uh, thank you to Jenny as well, both of you pro for providing wonderful insights and fascinating um, films and documents about the South Downs National Park. Uh, I'm sorry we had a, a technical hitch earlier, but um, I think you'll agree it was it was worth waiting to see those wonderful films. Um, what I'm going to do now is to put a few questions to our two speakers. Uh, and the first one, Jenny, is for you. Uh, do you have the date of the South Downs um, bus company map? Oh, yes. Um, so we don't know the exact date, um, but we think it's from around 1940. Um, which is actually about the same date as that wonderful photographs of the, the hikers in, in, the, in the South Downs. Thanks, Jenny. And um, staying with you as well, how, how, would, how would I find out more about farms and farming on the Downs from the archives? 
Um, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and there are a number of different ways that you could do that. Um, so I mentioned Cowdray, which is one of the large estates in the South Downs. Um, and of course, there are many others um, across West Sussex um, and, and within the South Downs. And um, we hold a number of um, estate archives at the record office. And because they're really big landowners, um, there's a lot of information there about um, kind of how they ran their farms, um, who occupied them, um, information about um, kind of how the land was used. Uh, so they're really, really good um, places to start looking. Uh, you also have um, things like tithe maps, um, which will give you an indication of the owners and occupiers of um, farms across the county. Um, so that can be really helpful as well. Um, and then you have things like um, valuation books, um, which are usually done when um, a property was sold or passed on to a new tenant. Um, and those give often include um, records of the numbers of live and dead stock um, on the farm, as well as giving you the name of the farm um, and, and the owner. Um, and so that gives you a real sense of um, the kind of what was, you know, what animals are there, um, how many, um, you know, were they grazing lots of sheep or, well, you know, was it more cows? Um, and then finally, we have um, archives of some individual farms themselves. So obviously farmers would keep their own accounts, um, sometimes keep farm diaries. Um, and those are wonderful because they provide real insight into what um, agricultural life was like um, in West Sussex at various different points in time. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you for that. Um, I, I must say how I've seen some of those, uh, those valuation books and in some of them, they actually give you the names of the horses and the cows, which is great fun. <laughs> Question for you, Frank. Um, how do you, um, how do you, how can I actually see more of the films? Um, I mean, you've got a, a wonderful collection. You've got over 10,000 films. So how can I actually come to the record office and, or, or uh, contact you to actually see them? Well, the, the easiest first step, um, if you have access to the internet, um, is to visit our site, Screen Archive Southeast, um, and by using the search engine, um, up comes films um, with descriptions. Um, sometimes it's extracts of the film or it'll be a whole film. Um, and that provides a very good starting point um, because by using the website, you can kind of orientate yourself and get um, become aware of, the, uh, of what's there. But also too, we're very, very happy um, for you to approach us by, by email um, when we get back to normal, by telephone too. Um, and of course by letter. Um, and that's the way in which you can ask us a few questions. Um, you know, for example, there might be only part of a film online where we could make it available to you so you can see all of it. Um, what we also do can fine tune um, your, um, your uh, inquiry um, because there might be other films which um, you're not aware of. Um, so we, we're very always here to um, support you as you explore the collection. Um, and of course, we're interested too in what you're researching, whether it's fam family history um, or a particular aspect of life in Sussex. Well, I think that actually segues nicely to the next question is, is how do you, what do you do with films when you receive them? Uh, and, and how do you research them? And I think that's a question for you, Jenny, as well. So when you were offered, when we're offered archives, you know, the process step by step, what do we do with them? Frank, do you want to start? first on that one? Yes. Um, well, the first thing, of course, when a, when, a, when a film comes to us or a videotape or a digital file is you have to look at it. Um, and, um, but it, when you look at it, um, it of course will reveal the subject matter, which is extremely valuable. Um, but sometimes a film comes to us and we don't know the name of the, of the maker. Uh, so unfortunately it becomes an orphan. Uh, on, on other occasions though, the film maker walks through the door and she <laughs> films which I have made, would you like to have them? Um, so it's, it's getting to know not just the content of the material, but it's also to uh, getting to know the nature of the filmmaker, and how she, he, um, the, con the circumstances in which they made the film, screen the film. Um, so the, the, like, the production, the exhibition and the content is extremely important to us. There's also two else, which is the fact that the film or the videotape um, can be in poor condition. Um, and uh, because of fragility 
uh, of, of, of the moving image. Um, we have to work very carefully with it. Um, so it means that when we take something in, we never use the master material. Uh, we always make a copy. And it's the copies which we preserve as well as make available to the public. Um, so it, it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm fascinated by um, working in a film archive or a screen archive um, is the nature of this work. Um, because we work very slowly because we want to reveal, unravel, if you like, each film's history, and maybe each film's mysteries. And I think that's one of the, the nice things and the exciting things. You never know what's going to turn up next. Jenny, I don't know if you want to say anything about that from, from the archive's perspective about, about what happens to the archive before it reaches the search room for everyone to see. Uh, well, um, as you say, Wendy, you, ne you never quite know what to expect. And um, we receive um, archives from all kinds of different sources. Um, and they come to us in kinds of shapes and sizes um, and condition. Um, one of the first things we do, either by talking to the depositor or when the records are deposited with us, um, is to kind of take a look through, um, to partly to assess the archive, um, to see if um, it does fit our collecting policy, um, and make sure that the material is going to be of, of long-term historical value and, and of interest to researchers. Um, we'll also be kind of checking to um, see if there are any um, conservation um, issues or issues with the condition of the material. Um, and we're lucky um, in that obviously, unlike films, um, you know, we can open up a volume or kind of look at a letter and we know kind of what it is um, pretty much right away. Um, if we find that it's, um, the archive has been stored in poor conditions, um, it might be mouldy, it might be dirty, and there might be insects, um, then um, it's isolated in our archive reception um, and it's cleaned um, by one of my colleagues, James, um, who does this with the museum back um, to kind of carefully remove any surface dirt, um, any um, dead insects, and to check for any other issues. And once it's been cleaned, we'll package it in acid-free boxes um, and it'll be housed in um, our, our strong rooms. Um, we'll then allocate it to a member of staff um, for it to be catalogued. Um, so this involves um, writing a brief title, giving the date and providing kind of other relevant information um, to help to make sure that um, if you're searching a catalog, you'll be able to find um, records that are relevant, relevant to your research. Um, we'll also provide it with a unique reference number and number of the document. And then finally, and we'll give it a storage location so that um, we can make sure that we can um, find it to produce it. Um, obviously with eight miles of shelving, we want to be very confident about where, where our records are. <laughs> yes. Thank you, both of you. And I wondered if we could finish up this evening just by talking briefly about how you, how we, how you chose the topics that we did for West Sussex Unwrapped. Um, because we have two very different collections of film and archives. Um, and yet we've sort of shown through this process how the two very much complement each other and the films will bring to life the archives and the archives will provide information about the films. So uh, how do you, how did we, and how do you think um, we went about choosing the topics? Um, we had a range to choose from, I think, and it was, we were spoiled for choice, but I just wondered if, if uh, either of you would like to say anything about that, just to finish up the evening. Well, my quick answer is it's, it's because the film resonates. Um, it resonates because it's something which is, it could be a, a subject which is in living memory. Um, for example, uh, activity to do maybe with a, a royal event, a royal visit or a jubilee. Uh, so it kind of resonates with ourselves and with communities. Um, it's also too, it's how the film uh, we would choose for West Sussex and Rap um, resonates with the collection of the West Sussex Record Office. Um, so it, it, it's, um, you know, it has a buzz to it. Um, and that's what makes it work. Um, because, and literally because it resonates, it actually enables us to say something interesting about it. Um, because yeah. you, know, you can start with the film and you look at it and you kind of, where's that? What year is it? What's happening? <laughs> That's a film which we um, wouldn't choose for use within West Sus within West Sussex Unwrapped because it's very hard work. Um, instead, it's working with something which is um, inherently interesting 
Um, and I think with this, for us, the value of this collaboration is how the two collections work together. Jenny, do you have you got anything to add to that? I mean, I think that's absolutely it. So um, I know when we kind of started talking about this, um, Frank, you and the team at the SASI had identified some, you know, absolutely brilliant films um, and around kind of themes and topics that we thought would have a really universal appeal. Um, and then um, as we kind of started exploring our collections, you know, we kind of saw how much there was that would, you know, kind of add to and enhance kind of what uh, the film was showing. Um, and in some cases, you know, enable people to travel back a bit further back in time um, to kind of find out more about the history of particular topics and themes. But um, it's a really, it's been a really exciting and really interesting, um, as you say, interesting collaboration. And um, yeah, it's been just wonderful to be able you know, to kind of see some of the films and to, you know, explore, you know, some areas that we might not otherwise have done and within our own collections. Yes, couldn't agree more. Thank you, both of you. I, well, I hope uh, to everyone listening that that's whetted your appetite, maybe some for some more episodes. And you can find all of our previous episodes on the West Sussex Record Office blog on our website. Um, as I said, we, the recording of this event will be going up on our YouTube uh, in a few channel in a few days' time, so you will be able to to catch up with it again there if you want to. We will also start putting up um, further material on there as well to explore other collections with you. So do keep a, a lookout for that. Um, next month, we'll be launching um, a new programme of online talks. Um, for those of you who know the Record Office, we, we have a, a Tuesday evening talks uh, once a month um, on a Tuesday at seven o'clock. So what we're doing um, at the moment is, is having a series of talks uh, and replacing those with, with remote talks. So our first one is going to be on the 27th of July, Tuesday um, at 7 p.m. when I'll be sharing with you some of the treasures in the record office, including some of my particular favorites uh, and those of the staff and uh, uh, our users and things that also that our volunteers have worked on or found really interesting. So I hope you'll be able to join me then for some, some more uh, explorations in the archives and in the meantime I'd like to thank both of our panelists for, for sharing everything with us tonight and I would very much like to thank all of you who've joined us and made it special, such a special evening. So thank you to everyone and uh, good night. <laughs>